Welcome back to the Alexander Schmidt Podcast, episode 042, Homer's Iliad, book 13, part 1. And this will probably, this book will probably be a two or three part series. I'll be working on it a little bit tomorrow, generating um, the content uh, before I, I speak it forth and, um, and the next day as well. And so, where were we? Well, let's recall all the way back from book 8 that Zeus has commanded all the gods off the battlefield. And so over the last several books, as Zeus has thrown his favor behind Hector in response to Thetis's request to him uh, uh, to hurt the Achaeans in order to honor Achilles for the harm that Agamemnon did to his honor, well, Zeus has been throwing his, his force behind the Trojans and Hector specifically like a wildfire he has spread through not only the wall of the Achaeans, but now onto the ships. And so since Zeus has been helping Hector, that's essentially like Zeus granting invincibility to Hector. So, well, he and the Trojans are winning. And what does that mean for the Achaeans? Well, that means, especially without the help of their gods who help them to strategize and breathe valor into them, that they're doing poorly and they're becoming dispirited. Add to that the fact that they've had five of their major champions injured, including both Odysseus and Agamemnon, and not the least of which, uh, Diomedes and Machaon, their healer. Um, the Achaeans have been having a bad time of it. That said, the stalwart Iases have been holding their line very well, and in fact, they'll be a big part of what happens today. And so, seemingly out of nowhere... Zeus turns his eyes away to watch the Thracian riders fight the Mycenaeans, Hippomolgoi, and Abioi, described as the most righteous of men. And the one clue we have into why that might be is that whereas on the field of battle between the Trojans and the Achaeans, the Achaeans are suffering from conflict within, and therefore the battle is not a battle between two harmonious wholes, this battle involving the most righteous men, the Abioi, may be therefore more pleasing to Zeus because there is more righteousness or justice or fairness present in this far off place at this moment. There is more unity of will <clears throat> and the major game, the big game, rather than the sub games and minor games or intrigues that come from within organizations or teams. Um, those are not taking center stage with these abioi and these hippomogoi might be the suggestion that's coming from there. And so, in the moment that he turns his eyes away, immediately the Achaean gods get down to mischief. And no, not Hera, not Athena. They've been chastised before, and they have received the threat from Iris of this thunderbolt of Zeus. And so, who is it that makes seemingly his first appearance? Poseidon. And he's described as being up a mountain that he had come out from his watery kingdom in order to mount. And so he, like Zeus, often sits atop a mountain, maintains a higher perspective. Uh, he also is a representation of order, whereas Zeus is a representation of heavenly order or the order of the cosmos. His brother, younger in this story, though not in any other um, <clears throat> Poseidon is a, and in fact, that wouldn't make sense given the general story about how Zeus came to be born and was the last of the Olympians significantly. However, now in the Iliad, he is the eldest, which gives him, um, gives him primacy of rank in matters of family, um, in matters of family conflict. And so, in fact, after this little, this little foray, Poseidon is going to make onto the battlefield against the will of his brother. Um, underhandedly, though, not openly. He is only going to advise the Achaeans and breathe valor into them. He is not going to openly fight alongside them. And in fact, he will be taking the form of mortals. So he'll be working underneath the surface, as it were, like water can be beneath the surface. And so Poseidon represents as earth shaker and earth encircler the principle of heavenly order as applied to the world, just as Hades represents the principle of heavenly order which exists beneath the level of analysis of the world. It could be either that which is too macroscopic or microscopic, that which can't be seen 
by man. Um, and so Poseidon has earth and circle or limits and provides boundaries and defines the world. And so Okeanos, who encircles the world, is now his province. Um, Okeanos, from whom we get the name Ocean. And as shaker of the earth, Poseidon, like Zeus in his storm-bringing aspect, can sow chaos into that which he generally orders. And so Zeus, as order of the cosmos, is also a storm god, like Marduk from the Mesopotamian religion. And he can sow chaos by throwing his thunderbolts down onto the earth, um, he, by drawing the storm where once there was placid peace. And in fact, he shows, he shows that aspect often in the Iliad by balancing fates, showing that he, he can bring ruin or glory to one, and also by um, maintaining the will of fate and telling the gods to stand off the field of battle. And rather, I meant, I meant for the second point to mention that uh, when Zeus speaks directly to Hera after the failed one-on-one -on -one combat between Menelaus and Paris, that he offers her peace if she'll accept it, but she chooses the path of war, and so he often negotiates and negotiates between whether there will be conflict and uh, or or order uh, chaos or harmony, and uh, in so doing that, he seems to represent sort of the principle of consciousness or how a situation can transform from one thing to another, from order to chaos, depending on how one deals with it. And, and he also represents the freedom of will that consciousness provides, because <clears throat> it is precisely how he negotiates which determines what will happen. And so in consciously negotiating, he is seeking agreement, which indicates that free choice is what determines the outcome of a situation with uh, Zeus. And so, interestingly enough, Poseidon, who represents his earthly and uh, watery or aquatic aspect, well, he is at odds with Zeus in this moment. And the fact that he is, is, at, he is at odds with Zeus is reflective of the fact that, the, that uh, Achilleus is at odds with Agamemnon and as well as the fact uh, that the Achaeans are losing to the Trojans. Um, there is an upset to the natural order of things. Achilleus should be subjugated to Agamemnon and fighting in the ranks, therefore having the Achaeans defeat the Trojans with Poseidon being able, being able to maintain his place uh, on his own mountain, somewhat alongside Zeus. Zeus is on Ida, and uh, Poseidon is along Samos. And so... The natural order of things at every level of analysis amongst the gods on the battlefield and within the uh, troops of the Achaeans is upset. And even within the heart of both Agamemnon and in Achilleus both being deeply troubled and in the hearts of all the other Achaeans who are now suffering um, the potential fate of a loss where they could almost taste victory just days before. And so... Poseidon descends from his high perch, having watched enough from which he first came up out from his watery, his watery home in Agai. And in fact, he, he plunges down there first, so he descends in order to go up. He will descend from his mountaintop into his watery home because he's lord of the sea, and he will, he will take his golden-maned horses with their bronze-footed uh, bronze uh, feet and his chariot covered in gold, and his armor covered in gold. And as you know, the, that gold is the color of divinity, and that's why angels have halos, and kings wear crowns of gold as representatives of gods, and why Athena in the Parthenon had golden eyes. And so golden, that which is unalloyed, pure, um, symbol of highest value, is that which uh, Poseidon, as a symbol of order, the, um, the ultimate property of existence, one might say. Uh, that is why he wears gold. And so, as one might imagine, he appears down on the battlefield in the form of Calchas. Calchas, we recall, is a prophet and thus can interpret the signs of the gods, and is thus a scion of the gods, or a sign of the gods. Um, Poseidon appears as uh, Calchas, and occasionally the gods will send a thought to a 
person, sometimes they will be represented as the person. Whether this means that the person speaks with the voice of the God, or whether the God has simply, for the moment, embodied the person while the person continues to exist in another place, is somewhat unclear. Though in the Odyssey, a point will be made the, uh, by one character that he saw Mentor, who was Athena in disguise, one day, and then saw the real Mentor the next. Um, but it's a little bit unclear. One might say, though, that Calchas here speaks with divine authority, and in so speaking, he speaks exactly the right words, which are the words of Poseidon, the ordering words. Because if anything is going to help the Achaeans right now, since Zeus is against them and his might making the Trojans invincible, the Achaeans have to fight the best fight of their lives. And in fact, they need two major things. They need to be as disciplined and well-ordered as possible using the powers both of Poseidon and Athena. Um, um, that's using their inner nature or working to their uh, innermost m might. That's uh, part of what Poseidon represents. One's uh, in innate talent and ability to implement it. And uh, Athena represents the discipline necessary to keep their ranks to prevent terror or the aspect of Ares uh, Ares' son, actually, is what Tara is described as in this book, uh, from entering their hearts. And so they need to be valiant, and they need to fight a tight fight in order to keep from being utterly decimated, destroyed in this, uh, in this book. And, and in fact, with the help of Poseidon advising them, and some excellent leadership on the part of Idomeneus, Mariones, and the Iontes, they certainly will. And so one thing about... Um, Poseidon revealing himself to uh, the Iontes is that, in fact, even though he speaks to both, he reveals himself actually to Aias the Lesser, who's more sharp-eyed, he's an arrow shooter, than um, Aias the Greater. Aias the Greater, however, in being stronger than Aias the Lesser, he, he hears the voice of Calchas, the voice of Poseidon, and doesn't recognize uh, that it comes from a god, but rather is filled with a a desire to kill Hector, to have a chance at Hector. And so he's filled with valor in a courageous way, whereas Aias, um, his, his top skill or his perceptiveness, his ac mental acuity is augmented by Poseidon. And in fact, those are the two, those are two of the strongest aspects of the Achaeans, the fact that they have such a massive physical force as even represented by Aias the Greater and tremendous skill in fighting also represented by Aias the Greater. And, um, and uh, Achilleus, of course, but also their mental acuity as shown by um, not only Aias the Lesser, but Odysseus and his exploits, um, and represented by uh, Athena as goddess, uh, or rather Hera and Athena. Hera offering the guidance and Athena offering the capacity to implement. Um, and so, that uh, um, speaking of the capacity to think something up and the capacity to implement it, which seem to be tied to the big five traits, creativity and conscientiousness, or to what uh, Dante would define as the intellect, or that which is at the top of uh, a sphere seven of the Paradiso, and the will, which is at the bottom on the moon. Um, there are several dualities in book 13 that we should uh, keep in mind as we go through it. The first is the one just mentioned between Aias the Greater and Aias the Lesser, and actually there was one before that that we mentioned, which was that between Zeus and Poseidon, um, as parallels of order on heaven and how it is reflected on earth. In fact, it is reflected by the water. The sky is reflect, reflected literally by the water and often can reflect the land on it, so that's a beautiful physical metaphor um, <clears throat> and very helpful. Aias the Lesser shares his smarter plan and Aias the Greater, his uh, uh, stronger nature, they both um, act and are going to implement themselves in the battle in the ways that they are best suited to. Uh, Aias directing track, uh, Aias the Lesser directing traffic, shooting arrows, showing his strong aim. Aias the Greater uh, using his massive strength and discipline and great courage in order to kill as many Trojans as possible and hold them off from the ships, especially because they're near his ship. So he has even more reason to fight hard. Um, later, Idomeneus and Mariones will be contrasted as lord and um, and a thrall or henchman, um, uh, similar to Zeus and Athena, person who has the plan, person who implements it, or Hera and Athena, as it often is here in the Iliad. Um, 
We'll, off, we'll also see, and we have mentioned just now, Athena and Ares in viewing the battle lines uh, as they as they um, order up or form up behind uh, the two Iontes. Well, neither are described as being able to find fault with the men. And so uh, Ares would find fault with the men in terms of them, uh, their attitude. They would have, uh, they would be cowards. They would be feel, filled with terror, his son. That would be something he could find fault with. So you are courageous or stalwart if he cannot find fault with you. And uh, Athena has to do with your strategy and your discipline. Are you holding to the plan? Are you implementing correctly? Are you sticking with it because you're intelligent and well-trained? And so the Achaeans are, they are showing that they are well-trained and, and diligent and that they are, they are fighting as hard as they possibly can. And in fact, a speech that will be given by Edominius to the men is that uh, he, uh, he would understand if the weak men held back like usual. But the thing is, no man can hold back in this fight. Absolutely nobody. They have nothing. They have nothing behind them if they lose. They have nothing to back them up. They are backed up to the ships. They have to fight the perfect fight, especially because they can tell, they can feel that Zeus is against them, that fate itself is against them. And so they are going to have to fight with every ounce of ability and every ounce of strength and willpower that they all have. And that all starts from the top. It starts from Ias the Greater and Ias the letter, Lesser setting the tone and Edominia setting the tone and Mariones setting the tone. And they're going to have to fight as hard as possible in order for the valor they have been filled with by Poseidon or a leading idea or mentality or set of principles, uh, they are going to have to embody that for the men behind them to embody that in order to embody the, the, uh, the, not, the, not the victory because they won't lose, but the result from the battle that they seek. And so they're going to have to be, they're going to have to conduct themselves like winners or at least like survivors in order to actually be survivors. And so uh, we'll also see two forms of Poseidon. One is Calchas the prophet, one is Thoas, leader of men, whose father is Andrymon, uh, and Andros meaning man. And so we'll see con uh, a conjunction of wisdom in that Poseidon, like Calchas, in the form of a prophet represents wisdom or the capacity to understand the situation at hand and to act accordingly, and will represent leadership. Uh, where when he acts as Thoas and speaks again to another leader, Idominius. And so uh, that idea indicating that wisdom and leadership are conjoined and that which should uh, lead a leader is wisdom. And that's also shown by Nestor's relationship to Agamemnon, for example. And um, just as mentioned earlier, the very last duality, of course, is the whole reason that the Achaeans are losing, which is mentioned uh uh, uh, book 13 lines 105 to 120 and 345 to 360 where um, it's mentioned that the Achaeans are losing because of Agamemnon's temper because he lost Achilleus from the battlefield and so Poseidon actually in the form of Calchas uh, yells out to all the men or rather this is Poseidon not in Ominius calling out he he actually when he calls out to several of the minor Achaean cap captains Marianes so as uh um if I look it up right now, uh Marianes, Tucris, Thoas, Antilochus, and also a few we don't know very well at all, Lidos, Deeperos, and Penelius. Um well what he says is I know that you're all mad at Agamemnon for losing Achilleus, but you can't be right now because you need to be driven by fear of dying, not at not at not by anger and resentment towards your leader. So you just don't have that luxury right now. And so each of these men then feels shame from what's been said by Poseidon. And in fact it's very interesting because what this seems to indicate uh indicate is that their consciences feel guilt at seeing the more lordly men, the Iontes, act in a way that embodies more courage and stalwartness than they have seen, which uh, offers the social function of producing in them guilt 
because they admire these individuals and wish to be more like them in order to embody these qualities which they believe to be admirable, like courage or stalwartness. So one could say that the shame was offered through the call of the god, or one could say that one's conscience was afflicted by noticing a quality better represented in another whom one admires precisely because of that quality. And, um, well, both seem to work very well. So, as I said, both Ares and Athena would be happy with the Achaeans because they're courageous, not fearful, full of terror, and they're well-ordered and disciplined. Well, Hector now urges on the Trojans, and he's described as like a boulder rushing down a mountain, but which uh, loses its inertia, stops at the bottom. And uh, so what does this mean? It means that he's going to lose momentum in this battle, and in fact, he will eventually lose momentum in this entire war um, uh, because he is not self-moved and self motivated in this way or self-propelled, it is Zeus's abilities. It is the wings of Zeus's eagle which are pushing Hector forward. And so whenever Zeus is not directly behind him, pushing him through the Achaeans, the Achaeans will, as a force, be able to stop him, um, which just indicates how incredible the Achaeans are as a fighting force, that even with Zeus behind the Trojans, they, they, the Trojans will fail to utterly destroy the Achaeans. They recall the prophecy from earlier that the Achaeans, like a snake in the talons of an eagle, will fight off the eagle, and though dropped to the ground, will slither off and live to fight another day. And so, the battle rages. Marianes attempts his man, Deiphobos, and this is sort of a metaphor for the entire day the Achaeans are going to have. Though he has the strength to strike at um, uh, to strike through the shield of Deiphobos, the brother of Hector, and though his aim is true, the the blade is the blade is blunted back, is spent backwards, and so he does no damage. And so it was his destiny not to kill Deiphobos in that moment. It was bad luck. It was ill fate. It was the ill stars, and so. That's how the day is going to go for the Achaeans. Though they have the proper aim and correct amount of strength, their tools or fate is going to fail them. And so they're doing as much as they can and still they'll lose. And that is something that I think all people who have ever played any sport or game know about. That sometimes, no matter what you do, you cannot win. And yet, even then, it is preferable to lose because the will of Zeus is against one than because one did not give his or her best in a proper moment. And in fact, the Achaeans represent that well here because if they do not give their best, it's not simply that they don't win, it's that they all die and their ships get burnt. So there are different levels of losing in this particular game and in life, which is far more complicated than any one game because it is the sum of all games and all games that could possibly be and all games that have been well, there simply there 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 certainly are differing levels of losing and winning in this game, and so Teucrus then recall the half brother of Aias the Greater kills Imbrius, and Hector then in response kills Amphimachus while aiming for Teucrus, but he misses him. Well, as Hector attempts to strip the armor from Amphimachus, Aias the Greater gets a, gets a chance to try and kill him and strikes him away with his uh, spear. It does no damage, but it does manage to keep Hector away from Amphimachus and the stripping of the armor, which would be a major morale boost for the Trojans and uh, a big defeat for the Achaeans. But Aias, Aias defends well, like a great goalie defending a, a shot from Pele, or some other fantastic soccer player, Ronaldinho, uh, from his heyday, or a Messi. Um, and so, then, in order to restore some order to the Achaeans, or to raise their spirit, a sort of dirty, barbaric trick is used by the Achaeans. They, they raise up Imbrius, Aias the Lesser does, and Aias the Greater cuts his head off, and they, they take his head and they throw it at the feet of 
Hector in a barbaric display of what they are, were capable of doing to one of the bodies of the Trojans, which the Trojans were not capable of doing to the bodies of the Achaeans, effectively saying that we keep our heads in situations where you do not. We are smarter than you and therefore better organized, and this is what we're going to do to your city and to your people, and that is the fate that we are saving for you, Hector. And so it's a highly symbolic move and also a barbaric move that's attempting to cause a great wave of fear or terror at, at seeing the mortality, at seeing stark mortality thrown in symbolic and physical form at, the, uh, at their feet, at the Trojan feet, all in that one moment that in seeing a, a rolling head of a man just alive but now dead, it would be as if one were seeing the face of a gorgon or pure nature, that which petrifies without uh, the reflective nature of culture to uh, take the sting or bite out of it, which is effectively why when we read literature and of tragedies and terrible, violent, savage things happening in literature, in order to inoculate oneself against such events happening in one's life. And for example, that's why I say uh, juniors uh, in a normal high school curriculum would read Heart of Darkness, which, you know, would be considered a most horrifying story under all circumstances, and yet is often required reading in our schools. Uh, one asks why that is, and, well, the reason is simple. War does exist in the world. Many of the people that read about war will someday be in the military or face some situation which requires or involves violence, and so literature reflects the world in which it exists as as it must and as it should because it is the way that we are first exposed to the extremes that exist within life and so poseidon now in the form of thoas exhorts idomeneus to fight alongside him and in fact first he suggests that the reason that the Achaeans are not doing so well is that perhaps Idomeneus is not fighting as hard as he could. But recall the favor that Agamemnon showed Idomeneus earlier and the wealth of Idomeneus indicated by his many ships. I believe it was 80 that he had, uh, Nestor with 90 and Agamemnon with 100. So he's very much wealthy. Well, Idomeneus again shows why he is a fantastic leader by having a clear-sighted view of the situation. He recognizes that what's happening right now is not due to his or the Achaean lack of valor, due to a lack of effort, or uh, due to um, being run by cowards and therefore having lost their order, in the wake, their order in the wake of the clash of battle. No, it has to do with the will of Zeus. The Achaeans are fighting as hard as they possibly can as well as they can, and Idomeneus recognizes this, and that means that he's a good leader. Well, then Poseidon, in the form of Thoas, invites Idomeneus to fight alongside him. Um, and that, that indicates that Idomeneus will be maintaining and instituting the principle of divine order within the battlefield, even though Zeus has disallowed that use. Um, <laughs> even though Zeus has disallowed the help of the gods, so well disciplined are the Achaeans that even when facing the invincibility of the Trojans, their innate and practiced capacities will save them, and Idomeneus will embody the capacity to lead men into a battle they cannot win and still survive, which means Idomeneus is going to be one heck of a leader. And so, Idomeneus now returns to his shelter. He's thrown a spear, and he's lost, and now he needs he needs another one. Well. When he gets back to his shelter, who should he see but Marianes, his henchman, on his way back. And so he gives Marianes a little bit of a hard time, kind of like a good leader or a friend from battle might. He says, are you injured? Did you come to bring me some message? Why, why is it that you're back here? And Marianes sort of has uh, no time for, for these sorts of questions right now. He doesn't much care for being questioned in this way. He, he is a valorous and valiant fighter. He has great courage and talent and skill, and it, it's sort of offensive to him. It sort of insults him a little bit. It gets under his skin that Idomeneus, of all people, would be insulting him, and he says as much. He says, 
of all people, you should know my exploits. And Ilmenius actually gets knocked back on his heels a little bit by this. He he says, "Oh well, you don't need to talk about it if you actually if you actually are this." And he gives he gives a a story of how if one were to have a coward and a courageous man and subject them to the conditions of battle, the coward would tremble and turn white and move from foot to foot like a neophyte speaker and would finally settle, whereas the courageous person would stand still and keep his color. And it would be obvious because of one's ability to embody courage that courage is actually real in the world and that one could take physical markers as indication of this. And in fact, we can do this sort of thing through skin conductivity tests, uh, which uh, I believe both Jung and, um, I know Jung first did in the, um, around 1912, 1913, 1914 as part of his experimental researches. But that's also now part of, for example, uh, what we uh, have as part of a lie detector test, uh, skin conductivity. Um, and so, this is a very sophisticated idea that the Achaeans are, are in Homer is sharing here that through physical changes one can tell the emotion or the emotion or level of 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 emotion one is feeling in a moment due to how one's physiology changes in measurable ways. And in fact that this is more telling about the truth of one's character than one's words. And that is exactly what Anomenia says to Marianes. And so he placates him as well. So just to go back through the situation for a moment, Anomenius respond or he asks Marianes why he's coming back, and Marianes says, I need a spear. I was attempting to kill one of the top Trojans, um, Deiphobos, the brother of Hector, and the, my spear broke. And the only reason I'm I'm coming near here is that my tent is far away. And Idomeneus then sort of brags. He says, oh, well, I, I have 21 spears, and I have so many of them, and so many shields, and so many swords. These are, of course, from all the men I've killed, insinuating that uh, Marianes uh, does not have any weapons because he uh, has not killed anybody because he fearfully runs from battle, which is what he must be doing right now. And Marianes says, no, I have a tent full of dead men's weapons and armor. It's just further away. So please stop questioning me is the idea he is trying to convey to his lord, but which, of course, he, he cannot quite say. And so he is only here to accept Idomeneus's spear because Idomeneus happens to be here, has made the offer, and it is closer um, to the battle than Marianes' tent, so it will allow Marianes to re-enter the battle soon. So there is a there is a parallelism here between the Lord and the henchmen. They both have the appropriate attitude, and they, they offer sort of a positive feedback loop to each other. Um, Marianes having the proper spirited, valorous attitude, and Idomeneus expecting that from his man and being able to bring the best out of his man and also to placate his man when he was perfectly willing to um, criticize him if he were acting out of line, out of, out of character, as it, as it were. And well, Marianes said he should not have to remind Idomeneus of his great deeds, which recalls to one Achilleus and Agamemnon, because it, of course it was due to Agamemnon's inability to recognize Achilleus's value that um, he is now injured and the Achaeans are now losing and Achilleus is out of the battlefield. Well, Idomeneus, after giving his account of the difference between the courageous and those of cowards, lines 275 to 288 in book 13, he says, listen, I know your worth. So even were you to be wounded in your work with spear cast or spear stroke, the weapon would not strike behind your neck nor in your back, but would be driven straight against the chest or the belly as you made your way onward through the meeting of champions. But come, let us no longer stand here talking of these things like children. For fear, some man may arrogantly scold us. Go to my shelter and choose for yourself a heavy spear. And just to give you the lines, too, on um, the, the comments he makes that I related to Jung's experimental researches into skin conductivity. He says here, line 275, I know your valor and what you are. This is him speaking to Marianes. 
Why need you speak of it? If now beside the ships all the best of us were to assemble for a hidden position, and there a man's courage is best decided, where the man who is a coward and the brave man show themselves clearly, the skin of the coward changes colors one way and another, like Paris earlier, recall him turning so white he looked green, and the heart inside him has no control to make him sit steady, but he shifts his weight from one foot to another, then settles firmly on both feet, and the heart inside his chest pounds violent as he thinks of the death spirits, and his teeth chatter together, but the brave man's skin will not change color, nor is he too much frightened once he has taken his place in the hidden position. This is like hide and seek, and I uh, but his prayer is to close as soon as may be in bitter division, and there no man could make light of your battle strength or your hand's work. Um, lines 275 to 287, or so there. And so, Idomeneus and Marianes enter battle, lines 310 to 338, and um, they're described as Ares accompanied by his son Terror, and so they bring with them the threat of death, uh, the inability to know whether one will survive or one will die during the onset of a battle where where death is present. And so where Idomeneus and Marianes, where proper order um, applied with proper aim is present in a violent altercation, well, their death is present too and likely the present, the, the death of those who oppose, those with the proper aim and the capacity to implement it. So... Um, just as battle, as threat of death produces terror, it as a single cause thus produces cowards and courageous men. One knows the two sorts of men by this singular quality. And the reason I mention this is that the next few lines will look through a contrast between um, two of Kronos' sons, Zeus and Poseidon. And... Well, they're described as two were of one generation and a single father. And in fact, actually, let me read this two lines, 354 to 360. Uh, Indeed, the two were of one generation and a single father, but Zeus was the elder born and knew more. And only in Homer is this true. Again, this is Homer changing mythology for his purposes to convey what he wishes to convey. And therefore, Poseidon shrank from openly defending them, but secretly in a man's likeness uh, was forever stirring them up through the army. And so, uh, the, these are the two sons of Kronos, two sons from one source. And so, this is, um, w as I said earlier, one reflects the order in heaven, whereas one reflects the order in earth. And so... <clears throat> Just as the heaven and the earth are the original split from formless chaos, so did Kronos rule Uranus, his father's province, heaven, and also Gay Gaia, earth. So, so was that which was originally one split into two. So was that which Kronos had rule over split into two for his sons. Three, technically, if you include... Um, uh, the underworld for um, Poseidon or for Hades as well, except for the fact is that the underworld with Hades was not necessary during the time uh, uh, of Kronos because, well, and depending on how one interprets mythology here, during Kronos was the time of the golden men who knew not death. And so there was, since there was no death, it, there was an Edenic time under Kronos, there was a lack of distinctions of being living or dead, you might say, or being and non-being. And so when the Olympians took hold of the galaxy and culture took root in the world, the world did not split from one into two, but one into three, heaven and earth and underworld, because not only... Not only did man come to be at the same time as the Olympians, either through the work of Prometheus or Hephaestus, um, depending on the account, generally Prometheus, sometimes by uh, Zeus, who's also described as father of man. Well, with man coming to be since man was mortal, so did the province of the underworld 
uh, have to come to be, and so did the province of the underworld. The underworld's underworld, Tartarus, have to come to be because that's where the titans of old, the old unconscious figures of the past were left, who were no longer the ruling dominance of the unconscious, unconscious or ruling uh, thoughts or leading ideas of the mind of man. And so with the leaving of Kronos, Tartarus had to come to be because a new body of gods came to rule. Hades had to come to be because man came to be and man dies and needs a place for his memory or shade to go, which might be the unconscious of mankind or the collective memory of mankind. Earth had to come to be because then there was a distinction between that which happened in heaven or the mind and that which happened in the world or outside the mind. And that's where Poseidon ruled. And heaven came to be because of the distinction between the world and that which could plan things which could be implemented in the world. And so there's a conflict now that should not exist between Poseidon and Zeus. If they reflect an original unity, then they should be unified, just as Achilleus and Agamemnon, who shared a, an initial unity within the army of the Achaeans, now have create an artificial split or conflict. And so why is the split in the army happening? Well, it's the same reason as the split in heaven is happening. It is because of the choice of Achilleus after being disrespected by Agamemnon. He leaves the army. He splits from the army. And in so doing, he asks Thetis, his mother, to talk to Zeus to hurt the Achaeans on whose side Poseidon is. And so it is due to the reckless decisions of man, of one man, of Achilleus, and of the mistake of one man, Agamemnon. It is due to man's recklessness that there is even division among the top gods. And so, something that we'll hear from the Odyssey, line 37 from book one, actually, I quote it so frequently with the students that I've memorized it, is Zeus will tell the story of Aegisthus and how he directly sent Hermes to warn Aegisthus not to lay with Clytemestra and have Agamemnon killed upon returning from Troy. But he did not listen, and so he will say, that it is the recklessness of man that is so often to blame for man's misfortune, though man is so quick to blame the gods. And so in the Iliad, where often my students are quick to blame the gods for that which is happening, we should be slow to think and perhaps quicker to remember that the current conflict even between the gods is produced by a choice made by a reckless man. And so... Tomorrow we'll pick up with the second part of book 13. This has been episode 42, Homer's Iliad, book 13, part one. Keep listening in, please. Keep sharing. Please uh, ask questions too. And have a wonderful day. Until next time. podcast you just heard was recorded with Anchor. If you want to make your own, download the Android or iOS app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast. That's anchor.fm slash podcast.